All right, thank you, Krista. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third in our series of Q&A sessions. Today's topic is the Adam Online Assessment Administration System, and specifically questions about proctoring and accessibility in Adam. Uh, my name is Dwayne Dixon. I'm the moderator and I'm the program manager for the main science assessment at the New Meridian. We also have Krista Averill with us, the assessment coordinator from Maine Department of Education. Our Adam expert responding to the majority of your questions is Bob Wolf, the senior project management analyst at MZD, as well as our project manager, Kate Richard, and our project coordinator, Amanda Doyle, for the main science assessment here at New Meridian, fielding the questions from the chat. So just a couple of housekeeping tasks before we get started. We do ask that you submit your questions via chat. We will be monitoring that throughout the ses session so that we can pick up your questions quickly and easily without having to worry about trying to speak over each other and figuring out whose turn it is to speak. We do ask that you keep your microphone muted unless we ask you to unmute it so that you can ask us a, spe a specific question or to clarify a question. Just a reminder that all of our Q&A sessions are recorded. And so if you have to drop off early or if you have a colleague who wasn't able to make it, you can direct them to watch those and listen to them. They will be posted within about a week on the uh, main science support desk. So, yeah, those are our people. Here is the toll-free number for the online support. And of course, right there is the contact information for the support desk. We are starting to see a few tickets trickle in with questions, which is wonderful. And just a reminder that we have three areas on the support website other than a button to submit a help ticket. Those are areas that you can go to and can send your colleagues to in order to get more information. You have videos and tutorials in webinar section. You also have a resources and document download section, as well as a area just for FAQs. They do grow as we adjust and the support desk FAQs are not static. We do adjust them. We add to them to based on the questions that come in from the program, from the field. So that is always a growing and a primary resource for you for any support on this. But at this moment, I am going to turn around and hand it over to Ms. Krista. To take us away and talk about some accommodations. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the accessibility features that are available on the main science assessment, including our universal tools, designated supports and accommodations. So we're gonna start with universal tools. Universal tools are automatically available to all students who take the assessment. So for the embedded universal tools within the platform, that includes things like review, uh, color scheme, font size, zoom enlargement, flagging or bookmarking items to return to them, line reader and response masking, which is the same as answer eliminator. The best way to prepare your students to interact with these universal tools is to have them interact with the practice tests that are available both on our main DOE website, as well as on the main science support site. Next slide, please, Dwayne. We also have a non-embedded universal tool that would be provided locally that scrap or scratch paper. So that can include paper, but it can also include individual erasable whiteboards or assist assistive technology devices as needed. Next slide, please. And then the next level of supports would be designated supports. So designated supports are determined on an individual basis by an educational team. And there are some examples on this slide of what an educational team might mean. Maybe it's a multi-tiered system of supports, response to intervention, individual language acquisition plan. But ultimately, the two most important things to remember is that an educational team is two or more education professionals with knowledge of a student's performance and that the supports must be consistent with the student's normal routine during classroom instruction. And the provision of designated supports does not alter the construct of any test item. In other words, it doesn't change what is actually being assessed. Next slide, please. 
So we have one embedded designated support and that's text to speech. So again, if an educational team of two or more education professionals with knowledge of a student's performance has determined that it's appropriate for that student to have text to speech on the assessment and it's consistent with their daily routine during classroom instruction, it is appropriate to assign text to speech on the assessment. Next slide. We also have several non-embedded designated supports that are provided locally. So they include breaks and extended time as the main science assessment does have three 60 minute sessions. So those are provided as designated supports, individual separate setting or small group setting, alternate aids and supports, which includes assistive technology devices, visual aids or auditory devices, and lastly, bilingual word glossaries from multilingual learners. So that's a dual language word to word glossary without definitions. Next slide, please. And lastly, we have accommodations. So accommodations are provided only to students who have that accommodation identified in their IEP or 504 plan. So that includes read aloud or human reader, American Sign Language, Braille, and Scribe. Next slide, please. As well as paper-based and large print forms. And you can find the request for a paper-based science assessment on our main science support page. Just please remember that that is reserved for students whose IEP or 504 plan specifies that assessments are not to be administered online. And I believe with that, I'm handing it over to Bob. Well, thank you very much, Krista. Um, we're going to take a, a look at um, a few things. So I've just kind of broken this proctoring into these four sections. And we'll actually jump in. I'll share my screen and you'll see how this works. But we'll be looking at proctor groups and alias proctor groups, um, how school coordinators can prepare their proctors for testing, uh, logging into the proctor dashboard, both as a proctor, so you can see that, and how um, as SACs, BACs, how you can log into the proctor dashboards as well. Um, and then last within proctoring, we'll look at the actual proctoring dashboard features. So we'll we'll go into proctor, um, proctor dashboard, I'll log in as a student, and we'll kind of just play around with some settings. Y'all can ask some questions and um, We'll see where that leads us. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Wayne, or whoever's driving. Cool. All right. So first, we'll go to uh, how do proctor groups get created, and uh, then why would I create an alias proctor group? So I'm going to now share my screen, and. Can you all see my screen? I hope that's a yes. Dwayne, can you confirm or Krista? That you can see the main screen? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. to be fair, I'm get myself off mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so let's just, this is uh, your screen and First thing I wanted to look at is uh, how do proctor groups get created? So proctor groups get created by the classes that you all are creating. So I'm going to filter this out by a pretend class um, in Northview Middle School. So Adam, of course, is scoped by your permission. So if you're a school coordinator, you will only see one school or a couple schools, maybe. If you're a district um, coordinator, you're going to see all of the schools within your district. But I've just limited my class search down to a single school. So I could look at these classes. So we use classes to, one, know how, to, how we want to create proctor groups. But this is also where we get our kids from. So within each of these classes, um, you can see this student column. This is letting me know how many kids I have in each of those classes that is going to translate into the students that are put into the administrations um, as those get created. 
So it all starts from here though. It starts from creating a class, loading students into a class. And then when we create the administrations, I'm gonna look for, in this case, this grades column, I'm looking for eighth graders um, or eighth grade class rather, and then I'll load these students into those administrations. So a couple things to look at. These are classes again, and this grade column is very important to us. Um, there's no grade associated with this particular class. So you'll notice that I have five classes set up for eighth grade and demo middle, excuse me, demo North View Middle School. Um, this class itself doesn't have a grade associated with it. So when I go over to test management administrations and see the admins that are set up for me, so I, I just built some eighth grade ones for, for our purposes. But when I go and look at an admin card for session one and click on proctor groups and look at those proctor groups, I only see those five classes. Those five classes built a proctor group for each one of those classes. There were six classes, but one of them wasn't designated as a eighth grade class. The grade wasn't on there, so it wasn't used to create um to create a proctor group so proctor groups within an administration are created based on the classes that you um that are built um, in your schools these classes or these proctor groups then like this group of five if i pop back over and now look at the proctor groups in session two we're going to have five proctor groups. If I look at the third session, I'm going to have five proctor groups. So that is important. important. Why? Well, when we talk about an alias proctor group, which is sometimes how we will subdivide then these classes that we have into smaller groups. Um, maybe I have my students that are text to speech and I want to put them into a separate room. Um, you can do that on each administration, so remember I have three administrations, um, I can go into each administration, create an alias proctor group, and I can call this TTS room, add my students, I can maybe go by accommodations and say, find all of my kids that are in this administration that have text-to-speech, and I can add those kids, and I'm only going to add two of them. I'm going to add those two kids into this Texas speech room. So now I have a new proctor group. We'll call it alias proctor group. It has a test code and proctor password. But watch what happens. So I'm in session one. If I go over now to session two, that alias proctor group doesn't exist. So I would do the same thing again on this on this proctor group and create a TTS room. And I would add text to speech, add those two kids, submit it. So now I have that proctor group that exists or alias proctor group that exists in this administration. Now I go again and do it for the third session. Okay, you get the idea. Alias proctor groups are admin specific. So each of your sessions for eighth grade, each of your sessions for fifth grade, each of your se sessions for, it, it, there's a lot of extra work that you can do. Why am I pointing this out? I'm pointing this out because these classes that were pre-created for me, or these proctor groups that were created for me automatically in each of these proctor groups, or each of these admins, I could have handled that if I already knew that I was going to have these classes and I was going to pull out a class alias proctor group for lack of a better word that was going to be made up of those certain amount of kids then why not just create a class in advance put those kids in it and then the administration would have been built automatically created with these five classes plus that text to speech proctor group does that, that kind of make sense? You don't have to, you can go and build 
alias proc groups on each of your um, admins if you want to. But what I wanted to point out is if you know in advance how these kids are going to be divided for testing, you could put them into a class or build that class in advance, and those would then be built automatically then built out the proctor groups in each of those admins. I'm going to stop there to see if any questions came up as I kind of talk through proctor groups and alias proctor groups and maybe some different ways that you might try to configure those. Uh, we did have one question come in through the chat. Uh, it says, if student, if a student finishes a session in less than the allotted time, can they start the next session early? That might be a Krista question, but. I am going to defer to Krista on that. I, I think I know the answer, but I would, this would be a great one for her to chime in. Yeah, that's more of a main DOE policy question. So we don't recommend having individual students working on different sessions. But if you had a student group that was taking a session and all of the students in the group finished the session before those allotted 60 minutes, then yes, that entire student group could move on to the next session. Um, but we don't want a situation in, in which one student in the group has moved on because the proctor needs to read the directions at the beginning of the session to all students at the same time. But if your entire student group finishes before the 60 minutes is over and you want to move to the next session, please take a break so that they don't get fatigued. But then, yes, you can move on with the entire group to the next session. Thank Thanks, you, Krista. Krista. And then, Bob, um, well, Krista, this might be both y'all sharing this one, but um, best practices here. Okay. Can everyone be in one group? Example, all of grade five, about 200 students. If proctors are actively proctoring, as in walking around and monitoring, they do not necessarily need to monitor session progress online, correct? So it is a two-part question. I'll address parts of it. <laughs> Hypothetically, can everyone be in one group? Yes, it still works. Um, do we recommend it? Not necessarily. It's a little hard to navigate the proctoring screen with 200 students. And although proctors can be actively proctoring in the sense of walking around and monitoring, and I think Bob will probably show this later, occasionally you do need to reseat students. That's been my personal experience when administering the assessment. And in order to reseat students, you do need access to the actual proctor dashboard. And I'll let Bob follow up with anything else that needs to be added for that. Uh, yeah, I think you I think you said it great. I mean, yeah, there's nothing stopping us from, you know, back on that classes page to just have a class of 200 kids. And then you just have one proctor group that's living in the administration. That's that's fine. One test code. Um, when we look at the proctor dashboard itself, I think it's nice to just have the kids in front of me um, on my proctor dashboard. And, and um just from ease of use. Um, but yeah, there's nothing stopping you from, you have control over how many classes you build. Yeah. Um, I guess we'll, I could just stop there. Yeah. You have control of that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, and as we look at proctor groups, maybe our proctor dashboard, maybe you'll uh, get a better feel for it, but yeah, nothing's stopping you from doing just one. And this isn't something covered in this Q and A session, but if we have time, maybe we move back to it but it was covered in our prior uh, Q&A session, whereas rostering, how you can actually download all of your students, quickly actually modify that document and re-upload it. But uh, that's actually covered in our previous one. And if we have time today, Bob might be able to cover that again, but there are ways to actually help set that up much more quickly than doing a one by one by one student kind of deal. Yep, there's, and there's a couple ways, and there's a couple articles out there. There's um, there is an article out there that specifically talks about quick class upload. That's my yeah. favorite method. Um, but there's another one, which is roster, actually what we just talked about, um, a very simple way to roster. If you don't need to create multiple classes and you're just rostering all of your eighth graders into a single class, there's an article about doing just that. It's also very simple. It's simple. It's actually a little easier than doing quick class upload, but um, I like having multiple classes, so it's my favorite. 
Um, okay, we're gonna move on to the next uh, piece of this, which is um, preparing your proctors. So again, once you've decided on your classes and um, all of that kind of rostering stuff is taken care of, and you actually get a chance to come in and look at your admin cards, um, of course, that's where you're getting your proctor groups from. But what we wanna give to our proctors is information about who's gonna be in their room, um, so the students, and we also want to give them how information on how to actually log into the Proctor dashboard. So there's two things that come about. So first of all, I'm going to go back and look at Proctor groups. So each of these Proctor groups has a unique test code and Proctor password. The test code is what we give the students. That's what they need in order to start testing. Plus, they're going to need their student ID. The Proctors, in order to start the Proctor dashboard, they need both the test code and the Proctor password that's unique to their Proctor group. Okay, we're gonna start there. So back on this admin page, the two things that we wanna to give to our proctors, I'm gonna get from this print cards area. So I am logged in again as a, um, a school coordinator kind of. Um, so I'm, when I cl click on print cards, I'm going to see all of the kids in my school. If you're a district administrator doing this, you would see all of the kids in your district in, in this grade. Um, now, this is one of the views of the print card. This is fine. Um, you can use the print button up here and print these cards out, cut them out, and then hand them to each of your proctors. You can also, choose to print these by proctor group. Maybe that's what I would actually do. I would turn them all off and I would choose a single proctor group. That's the one we just created, that alias proctor group. Print this off, it's already grouped. I know I'm gonna print these, cut them, and this is what I'm gonna to give to the proctor. Let me turn these all on because I'm gonna show you my favorite view of this. So this is just cards. This is what you give the students so that they can log in. I like to toggle this layout to this option, which is toggle title pages. This is going to automatically group this document that I can print by Proctor Group. And the first page that's gonna print out for me is for this specific Proctor Group. So this is that TTS alias Proctor Group we created. It has both the test code and the proctor password on this on this sheet plus it gives me my roster so now i have a sheet that has all of the student ids on it that will um, help me to um, log help these students log in if they need the help if you scroll down through this the rest of the pages then would include the actual cards so if you change this layout you can print the pro the proctor roster plus each of the cards and now if I move down through this, I'll get my next Proctor group. Again, new test code, new Proctor password, and the students in my room, and then their cards, so on and so forth. Does that make sense to everybody? This is, again, one of the ways to get the Proctor roster plus the cards. Um, you can really do this however you'd like. Dwayne, any questions about test cards and rosters that came up? No. Um, notice that when I went from the admin cards to print cards, that it opened up a separate tab at the top. So this is, you would print from here, you can close this, and then you're back to your admin cards where you can just move on to the next one, print the cards, do the same thing again. So the idea is we're creating a proctor packet for the proctor. You already are giving them their instructions. What's their script? but you also want to give them the student information, which might include the proctor roster plus the cards that they're gonna print out. Sorry, my mouse is being, there we go. Okay, great. 
So the next thing that I want to look at are the two things that you need in order to log into the Proctor dashboard. So again, you, you don't have to use the Proctor dashboard if everything goes swimmingly, but you might need to reseat a student. And let me just talk about that, that wording. So we're, we use the word receipt um, because as a proctor, it's your job to determine whether or not a student should be in this test or not. If that student leaves, imagine you're actually doing this test and as a paper test and they're in your room and the student leaves the room for whatever reason. As the proctor, as the teacher, you have control over whether or not you let that student back into the classroom, let them sit down again and take their test. So that concept of reseating is the same for our online test. If that student exits the test, so maybe that means that their computer shuts off, the internet goes down, power goes off, or they close their machine and they leave. In order for them to log back into the test, the proctor has to reseat that student or allow them back into the test. That's the concept of reseating. And it can happen for lots of different reasons, some of which I just mentioned. So although our proctors are moving around and, and making sure that everyone's doing all right, you can kind of see a lot of stuff in the proctor dashboard, including being able to reseat students. So logging in. As a proctor, again, we're going to um, we're going to be armed with some information. So I'm going to log in. Let me write this down because I forgot to do this. Um, X W E E two four and seven Q W T five W. Okay, that's nice. So. We can see when we're looking at this administration, some progress within each of these proctor groups. So as a school coordinator, you can come into a proctor group. And if I back up again, I can see some of that from out here as well. I can hover and see there's two complete. There's none in progress, 59 not started. If I drill in, now I can see a bit more detail. Where are those kids that are in progress or are completed? I would also see where are they when they're started. So I'm gonna open an incognito window, just so I don't, I'm gonna to pretend to be a proctor. So I'm gonna to go to adamexam.com. I will click on proctor at test and enter in those test codes. So XWEE24, 7QW, T five W and if I've typed everything correctly, when I submit, it's going to say, "Are you sure you want to go into this proctor group?" Confirm. The first time somebody comes into this proctor group, they're going to be asked to put in their first name and their last name, and then they're let into the proctor dashboard. The proctor dashboard contains information about the tests that we're taking the name of your proctor group. It has that test code and proctor password here. As the proctor, one of the things that I'm gonna have the, 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 the uh, school students do is log in. So if, even though this is on their test card, um, if I didn't hand out test cards because the students already know their state ID, I can just put this on screen and let everybody see what this is, or maybe I'll write it on the board. Um, so there's a little expand here. Um, and then this is a list of all the students who are in my room. I can tell what their status is. Um, and over here is where I will reseat in actions. This is where I will, will reseat students once they actually start taking the test. So proctors, this is how they will get in. They'll go to adamexam.com and click on login as a proctor. You can do the same thing as a school coordinator or district coordinator. Once you're into an admin card and you drill into the administration, you have the option over here to click on proctor. 
And when you do that, that takes you into the same Proctor dashboard that the Proctor can get to. It's just really nice for you because you can come in and continue to click on new Proctor groups to, to look at from, from here back. Again. All right, so I can just keep those open for the ones that I'm looking at. Um, okay, well, let me go ahead and now take the next step here. So let's see, Athena's is already logged in. So any questions about those two ways to log in? If you're logged into Atom, you can go under the administration card and click on Proctor Groups and click on Proctor and see the, the, uh, the dashboard. Or if you are a Proctor and you don't have access to Atom, you're going to enter the Proctor dashboard through adamexam.com and click on Login as Proctor. So what happens in the Proctor dashboard once a student logs in? So we're going to log in here as this kid. And I'm going to open another incognito window. I am cheating because normally a student's going to have to go in through the lockdown browser. Um, but this is a fake test, so I can just come in through take the test. In fact, I'm going to move this off. Well, let's see. Maybe it'll be fun to see. At least the beginning stage of this. It starts. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is what our students are going to see. Of course, they'll see it in the lockdown browser. They're going to enter in their test code. Each Proctor group has its own test code. And I'll go to next and enter in my ID. As the proctor, you also see this identifier, col identifier column, and that's going to give you the state ID. So when I click on next, see if the magic starts, confirm. I'm going to refresh over here just to see if anything's going on. All right. So the proctors will, they're not going to just be sitting at their desk. You're right. They're walking around. They're looking at what's happening with the students. Um, but when they come back to their desk, they can just click on this little refresh icon. They can turn on the auto refresh every five minutes. They're still going to click refresh when they come back to their desk. It's just how they're going to get the new data. So this is now showing me the student is starting to test. I'm in progress. The health is active. And I can see what section they're on, what item they're on. You can also see this receipt session. So if this student, so I'm going to go ahead and start the test. And I'm now going to exit the test. So eventually this is going to catch up, but here's the, here's the key. That student, if they get out of the system, if they get out of their test rather, if they come back in, and of course I'll have to put in the test code again, Y3374. And enter in their ID, SSID 059. They're going to get a warning message. And that's telling them, telling, yeah, so it, it's helping both of us, right? So 
it's telling the student that they need their proctor to do something. And it tells them directly, please ask your proctor to receipt you. So in order for this student to be able to log back in, they need to receipt the session. So I'm gonna do that now. I'm going to receipt the session. So this student said, Mr. Wolf, um, I can't get into my test. And maybe I'll ask why they are out of their test because um, I don't know. Um, so troubleshooting that, but eventually you will have to receipt this student. You go into progress equals receipted. And now I can log back in again. And if everything is working properly, 3374, process ID 0. Five nine. Now the student comes in and is back to where they started from. That ghost was my cat. So sorry if you're looking at my my face. Um, okay. So what question? That's a really the what you're going to be doing is reseeding. Um, there is a function here to submit a session. This is another thing that I just, I don't want people to be afraid of. Um, this button submits the test for the student. Okay, that, I mean, that's bad, right? We don't want to do that. The student is in the middle of their test. Um, but if that happens, or even if the student submits their test, as long as we're doing this on the same day, and Krista, you can speak up to this if you want, uh, or if you if you if there's more rules on this, if that student submits their test and they didn't mean to, Mr. Wolf, I submitted my test. I wasn't done reviewing. I don't know what happened. Um, oh yeah, you can see here, test is submitted by the proctor, so they got kicked out of their test. The proctor can unsubmit the session, then reseat the session because they're out, right? So we need to reseat them as well. Now the student could log back in and start that process again. So those are really the things that the proctor is going to be doing. Reseeding if something happens, if the student submits before they mean to, the proctor can unsubmit the test and then reseed the session and the kid will get back into the test. Krista, do you want to add anything to that of what our rules are for Reseeding and unsubmitting, that kind of stuff? No, I think you've pretty much covered it, that it does need to be done in the same day. Um, I will tell you from my personal experience administering the assessment to my fifth graders that, um, at least with fifth graders, you will need to reseat someone. So make <laughs> sure that someone has access to the Proctor dashboard. It will happen. Um, but it's a really, my experience has been that it's a very easy platform to use as a proctor, very straightforward um, and very easy to monitor where students are. Um, okay, well, I think that was that was it for that step. Um, Dwayne, do we have any questions that have come up on chat? No, uh, no, we have not. Okay. Um, just a couple more things to cover here and hopefully get you out of here early. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just close out of that test. Um, there is a, an indicator um, in the Proctor dashboard to let you know whether or not the student has text to speech. Um, as a school coordinator, you have the ability to enable, or in this case, disable text-to-speech um, for that active test. So now it's off. When the student continues, text-to-speech would turn off. So you have the option, you have the ability to turn that on as a school test coordinator. This is only doing it for this session. It is not turning text-to-speech on for the student itself. So it's not adding it to the student's accommodations. Um, but that function is available um, within the proctor dashboard for school coordinators. Um, you can also see the list if accommodations are enabled for a student 
they're also going to be here. Um, once a student starts to test though, other than being able to toggle text-to-speech, other accommodations you really can't do too much with. Same thing goes with the name of the student. So the name of the student is here, it's in the Proctor dashboard, they've already started. We're kind of done at that point. However, if you have come to um, this page and you are, nobody has started the test, so let's say session two, and you're printing the cards and you're reviewing the cards as we tend to do, if this ever happens, um, sometimes it just takes a few seconds for this to come up. If it takes longer than a few seconds to come up, um, you might refresh or even close it and try it again. They should all come up, but there's some, there can be a delay if there's a big class. So back to this, if you are looking at this and you see somebody's name is wrong when you're printing the cards, you can close out, you can go back to users, find that student, edit the student, change their name, save it. And then at the top of the hour, so it does take an hour, so I kind of want to do this in advance, the administration itself will get updated with that student's name so that you can print the cards and the new name will be put into play. Um, or accommodations, again, if, if you want to do accommodation sets. Um, and make those changes in advance. You can also come into, um, again, in an, in an administration, you can click on view, so view students. And this will also show me all of the kids that are in this administration. It will show me any of their accommodations. And we are not using accountability codes. Is that right, Krista? Correct. Yeah, okay. So you can also come here and view whether or not the correct accommodations have been applied to, to your students. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. Anything else you want me to cover, Krista? Oh, I know one thing that I wanna cover. Sorry, then I'll, then I'll hand it back over to you. Um, as a school administrator, um, I think it's very helpful to understand how to search all of these cards. So you're not going to just have three cards. You're, you may have fifth, fifth grade, eighth grade. You have a whole slew of cards in here. And somebody might say, hey, um, I have to find a name. There we go. JC is having trouble in her test and you're gonna come here and say, hmm, okay, what test is she taking? What uh, admin is she in? And so from this administration screen, you can come to this filter. This is one way, I'll show you a couple ways. And search for JC. This is gonna only show me the cards that JC is in or the administrations that she's in. Then I can come to Proctor Groups, and I can and again search for JC. And now it's going to show me which Proctor Group JC is actually in. I can click on Proctor, and there I'm there to help with whatever's going wrong with JC. You can also, and let me get her first and last name here, JC Moore. Okay. And this is actually, this might be newish. So I can also come here. This is um, rostering users. So find the student, JC Morrill. And I can come over to this administration tab. And I can see a list of all the administrations that JC's in. This is another great tool. I can see this is this is left over from before. So I can see if they've, uh, if they've not started, if they're in progress, I can see if they've submitted. So a couple good tools for you to kind of help manage through that. All right, now I'll hand it over, Krista. Well, we do have two questions in the chat. Um, so one of them is, do we have to wait for the window to open before we can see the cards for the kids and the proctors? 
So the administrations in Adam will open on April 24th. So although you can see them on Bob's screen right now, you'll have access to it on April 24th. And at that point, you'll be able to print your um, assessment cards. And then Bob, there's a question that I'm gonna have you confirm, but it says, are there any major changes from administering last year to this year? The the biggest change that you will see, I, I think that back on the um, on the student card, how we might've actually had that, back on the rostering users, being able to see which admins they're in, I, that might've actually been there. The biggest change that you're going to see is what we're looking at right now the admin card looks different than it did last year, last window. Uh, it still has all the same information. It's just that it's organized so that you see all of the student information under the word students and all the proctor information under the word proctor groups. Um, and there's this graphic on here now that lets you see um, the status of the admin. Otherwise, there's not any changes or nothing major, nothing that you're really going to notice in um, what the student sees or how you work um, with the information. Um, uh, I, I, let me back up. There is in the, um, in the activity report, if you used that at all last time, do we have that on Krista? Do you remember? If we did as a proctor, I didn't use it. Not as a proctor. Oh, yeah, correct. I, that that was my role. <laughs> Last year, <laughs> right. would have been a proctor. <laughs> so, so the activity report is another. I use this when um, when somebody calls um, from Maine and says, "Oh, how, how many report? How many people are actively testing today?" or um, or things like that. This is scoped for your school. So, if you're in here looking, um, this top cards up here are going to show you how many total kids have tested. Um, or submitted tests over these periods of time. But then you can also come in and set these filters for activity. Um, so you might set this for today or maybe for the entire window. I don't really care so much about these three tiles, but what I do care about is down here at the bottom. So based on, if I set this for today, based on today's testing, this is gonna show me I only have one test that's active, but for you guys, you're going to have fifth grade tests and sixth and seventh, eighth grade tests. Um, and this is going to tell you how many students in each of those grades, each of those sessions is currently active. So a really quick way for you to say, do I have people still taking session one or is everybody in session two on this day? But as a school coordinator or district coordinator, you can get that the bigger picture of what's happening um, on a particular, in a particular time frame, You can also use this progress report. And this is another way for you to narrow this down um, by a specific test. And then drilling down through the organization into a specific district. Again, this is scope. So you might start at the district or you might start at a school. But then you can eventually get down into the school, how many have submitted, what's your progress, not started, and continue to drill down. Eventually, it takes you into the proctor groups within that specific school for that test, where, again, you can see progress um, through that administration. So although that's not maybe new, it might not be something we spent a lot of time on, on how different ways for you to manage um, everything that's happening within your school. And these are a couple of good resources for you. More questions? I was gonna say something to consider too, Bob. I think you've already mentioned it, but before we move off the screen is, you know, this is a great way to check to see if all the kids had finished at the end of the day, like somebody actually didn't just leave their seat and actually forget to submit and you have a test open, even though the tests will auto submit at 11 p.m. that night but also as the preferred name that was new this year. Correct, and preferred name will pull. Yeah, that's right. We talked about that last time. I kind of forgot about it. Preferred name, um, and that pulls into the admin cards as well. So if you yeah. update the preferred name, that will pull into the admin cards at the top of the hour. Um, Can you briefly show us where the preferred name lives here? Because I know we may more than likely have a different group of people here from last time. Yeah, 
So I'm going to go to rostering users. And again, let's just look at JC. So JC's here. I can go into edit. And preferred name shows up right underneath the main, the first name and last name. And I believe that your business rules are, we really don't want you to touch first name and last name uh, because those have been provided by, um, by the state. But if you need to make a change because of preference by the student or teacher or parent or whomever, this is what you, we would like you to use preferred name changes. And just adding to that, the really nice thing about this is it's reflected in basically all of the public facing parts. So the student's test ticket has the preferred name with the proctor sees in the dashboard is the preferred name. Um, and so it really does provide that level of privacy for students wherever needed. And there was a question in the chat about um, whether we are working towards having a similar field in our other assessments. So we have been in discussions with our other assessment vendor about also including a preferred name field within their platform. Um, it's something that we hope to have in the future, but weren't able to implement this spring. Um, I will also say, because this will probably come into support, but notice this little icon up here at the top of my administration page. I want you to use the filter because it's still very helpful, but if you still have a filter on, you may not see all of your administrations or the data within them. So if you see that little icon, it's letting you know that there is still a filter there. You can go and clear that now. And again, I'm only seeing admins that JC was in, but um, you will notice that that's, um, that that's there. You can also change this to this view, which if you have a lot of administrations that you're keeping track of, this might be an easier way to see a dozen um, admin cards than to see them um, like this. They don't have all of the same functionality. So just to keep that in mind, there's a card view that you can look at as well. It's been so quiet. I hope that's a sign of good things to come. Um, but questions, they can keep coming. We um, we really love um, being able to utilize um, our Zendesk site for, for articles and FAQs. So as we hear of um, the questions that come up in, from the field, uh, things that aren't quite working right or questions, um, we can create FAQs on the spot um, and push those out. And our support team uses those then to send out to anyone who's creating little snippet articles that can help with um, little clarifying issues. Um, you will also could possibly see, um, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna go back to the login page. I wish I would have done that. Um, I'm gonna go back to the login page and when um, on this very first page, you might see um, information. We have the ability to build bulletins. And so pay attention when you log in also. Um, if we have important information, it might show up here. Um, as you know, maybe we made a mistake and we're going to highlight some new articles. We can do that here um, also in um, the help desk or excuse me, in our, the Zen desk site. This green banner at the, up at the top that hopefully always says no issues at this time could turn into a red banner that would say, hey, stop doing what you're doing. Something is happening or whatever. If we have an alert, that's typically it'll show up here and it might show up back here as a banner, as a bulletin, excuse me. All right, I'll let you guys close it out. I was gonna say, Bob, since you have the Zendesk pulled up, if you'll just take a brief moment and um, just show us the, I know the search capability, I'll be honest, when I go to help sites, I typically never use the search capability. I typically go to Google and search and come into a site that way a lot of times the search capability isn't really that good. This one really is. 
Um, so yeah, so thanks, Dwayne. Um, for example, if I'm looking for something, I don't know if I'm adding or deleting or moving or whatever, just type in some keywords and it's usually pretty good at finding things. Um, if I'm looking for things like rostering or if I'm looking for um, proctor, kind of have to spell it a little bit right, but yeah, the search is good. There's, you know, open these different articles. Um, like Dwayne pointed out earlier, if you want to request help um, soon-ish, we're going to have um, some more additional functions turned on with help, which will include being able to call into the support desk and chat and yeah, those those functions are going to be turned on. Oh, come on on Monday. Monday. You search for Q&A. Just want to show one thing since you already have the screen. Uh, use ampersand. It should show up. There we go. Um, there it is. Your rostering accessibility. Just so everybody can see, once we're done posting them, they will be on here and they'll be in this format. You will actually have a full video of today's um, Q&A for anybody that might have missed it. Or if you want to refresh, we also have times with topics there in case you want to fast forward, as well as the questions that were asked and their associated answers down below. And if you really like to see the questions uh, um, or would like to see your names in lights, um, you can come in and if you did ask a question, your question and answer will show up right here in Zendesk. Mm -hmm. Like I said, give us about a week, but it'll be there. Cool. And I think there was this one last thing is, I believe you did cover it, but I just wanna make sure verifying accommodations for proctors and on the proctor dashboard. Yep. Okay. So with that, I'll grab back the screen. And kind of take us on out here. We have our support desk information here, as well as their phone number web address, kind of the brief call out here and where to go. And honestly, that is our very last slide. So Krista, if you wanted to cover anything else before we sign off, open it up for anybody else for questions. I think the only thing that I have left to say is if you have any questions that come up after the session today, feel free to reach out to me by phone or email and we'll be sure to follow up.